What's up, what's up, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of The Michael Balco Show. Joining me today is a 10-year NFL veteran who spent time with five different teams, a former tight end for UCLA, and a current post-game analyst for the Washington Commanders at 106.7 The Fan, the one, the only, Logan Paulson. How we doing, brother? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So first and foremost, we got to rep the hometown. Tell us about your hometown and what makes it so unique. Uh, I don't know if anything about my hometown is super unique. Um, so I, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, which is about 25 minutes uh, north of UCLA. So I grew up in like it's kind of suburbia. It's got like a little bit of a city feel to it. Nothing crazy. You know, not, nothing, nothing to uh, the nothing to descript about the area, you know, kind of just suburbia close to a big city, you know, kind of that kind of vibe. So um, not a whole lot going on, but it is kind of uh, right near Calabasas, which is like, you know, kind of a lot of Hollywood people live there. And, um, you know, I didn't live in that area, but, you know, there that, that's kind of the, the the area that I lived in. So that's the spot to go trick or treating is what you're telling yeah, me. Yeah, that's right. They got the king size <laughs> candy bars. That's right. Hey, we love that. We love that. So you were a four star tight end, number 15 nationally coming out of high school. Um, what was your recruiting process like and what factored into your decision to attend UCLA? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really 15. I mean, I don't remember it being that high, but that's kind of cool. Um, yeah, so I, I was a guy who I was a multi-sport athlete in high school, and I was really a very committed soccer player through through high school, like leading up into high school. And that's what I thought I was going to be doing. So I kind of had a lot of resources and time invested in um, soccer. And then uh, in my sophomore year of high school, we had a coaching change and the new coach came in and basically told me, I think you can get a division one scholarship offer. And I was kind of like, I don't think, you know, I don't think that's in my cards necessarily. And he was a guy who really pushed and motivated me and, and did a lot for me from a recruiting standpoint, made my highlight tape, sent it out to schools. And when colleges would come like the year before, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I went, I graduated, we had two or three guys go division one. So there were a lot of those colleges, a lot of the pac 10 at the time, uh, coaches in the locker room and, um, coach introduced me to those guys. I had a camp at USC that I did a really good job at. And then I started getting a lot of offers, a lot of interest. And, um, and it, it just kind of fell for me. And, and it was the support of those other people in my life, the coaches, you know, my parents taking me to these camps and, uh, just, seen an opportunity where I didn't necessarily see it, which was pretty cool. And then, um, you know, in terms of schools, like my, uh, my family's very academic in nature and background, right? Like my grandpa went to Harvard, my uncle went to Harvard. Um, you know, my dad went to MIT, like, you know what I mean? Like it's a very kind of serious school. So obviously education was kind of the number one thing, you know, in looking at a school and, um, you know, I looked at Stanford, I looked at Duke, looked at UCLA, looked at Harvard, and uh, and I just felt like UCLA was kind of the best balance of football, education, and just kind of life outside of football. Like uh, Stanford was terrible at football when I was looking to go there. I think they'd won one game in two years. Duke was just kind of revitalizing their program. I think they'd won two games in like three years or something crazy like that. So it had been, been a long time. And, uh, and so I ended up setting on, settling on UCLA. It was relatively close to home. My girlfriend, who's now my wife, was going to UC Irvine, which is about an hour and a half south. So it just seemed like the right situation. And, you know, I had a great time at UCLA. It was, it was you know, awesome school, um, awesome kind of variety of social things to do. You know, the beach is 20 minutes away. You can go skiing if you want to. Uh, you know, like, what, it's really whatever you want to do. You can go down and party in L.A. if you need to. Um, that really, really wasn't my thing. But, you know, it just worked out great. It was the right fit for me. And felt challenged academically and challenged from a football standpoint. So it was, it was kind of the perfect fit. That's awesome. So I've talked to several people on the show and a lot of them are torn on the whole camps thing. I know you mentioned that you went to a lot of camps in high school and that, that ultimately helped you land that D one offer. What, in your opinion, do you think, um, is the importance of, you know, attending camps as a high schooler if you're trying to get recruited. So obviously I think it's important to add some context. Like camps now are way different than camps when I was coming out. And that sounds crazy, but that was, shoot, that was like 17, 18 years ago now that I was doing camps. And one of the things, probably 20 years now that I'm really thinking about it. So one of the things that sticks out to me about the camps is it, it just, <clears throat> it, it afforded me an opportunity because I came from a, a small Catholic high school. So when I went to that USC camp, which was an unpadded camp, we ran 40s and we did one-on-ones. 
And I remember coming out of that and there were other colleges that were at that camp and it did give me an opportunity to get some visibility. And it was the best guys in the country were all there. And I just was a guy who was pretty good for the local area. They offered an invite and it wasn't like a big lift for me to get there. And uh, I was able to kind of go up against some of the best guys in the country. And, and I think that was maybe the most impactful part of my recruiting process. I mentioned the tape, but I felt like that, that kind of tipped me over the edge was, was that camp because everyone saw like, you know, he's a big kid, he runs well, um, and he's not afraid to compete because I was very competitive at that camp. And, uh, and I think that's all important. And coming out of that, I had zero offers. And then UCLA, UCLA actually offered me coming out of that camp. And then once UCLA offered me, that's when I had like a cascade of offers. Cause like once that big school offers you, um, everyone kind of says, Oh, who's this kid? And then maybe we should offer him. So, um, I do think camps are important. I, I think you just got to be careful to what type of camp you're going to. Cause I went to like the spark, you know, like I think it was the spark camp at the time where you like, you run a 40 and do all this stuff. And there was zero opportunity for coaches to see what I do compared to the USC camp where it was like, there's coaches around every drill, you know, we're watching, we're watching people run. I'm actually getting coached there. There, there's a really strong interaction there. So I think just being aware of the quality of camp that you're attending is going to be important. And then what kind of opportunity is the camp giving you? Are you going to be one of 500 receivers at a camp? Like, come on, you're not going to have an opportunity to show in some ways it'd be better to go to a smaller camp and show out and kind of get the word of mouth going that way. So, and I think the other thing just for me personally is it showed that I, it showed me that I could compete at the next level. Cause there was always a little bit of doubt. I told you I made the transition from a different sport. So I, I think from a personal standpoint, it was good. And then also from the recruiting standpoint, I think I just kind of lucked into going to a really good camp with some really good kids there. And uh, it, it kind of helped boost my, my status in the recruiting process. Yeah, it was a perfect fit for you and you killed it. And that's why you ended up at UCLA when you <laughs> crushed it. Um, you crushed it on both on the field and in the classroom. Um, which is one thing that you said was super important to you. So that's incredible. Um, you earned several academic honors. What advice do you have to any high school or college athletes out there about prioritizing education and why it's so important? Well, I think, you know, when you're in high school, because I am a high school football coach now, and one of the things, that the first thing any coach asks me or the head coach is, what are his grades like? Because ultimately they can't get you in if you don't have good grades. So if you're thinking about getting recruited or if that's on the radar for you, just make sure you're taking care of that stuff in the classroom. You're not, you might not be the best student, but just it, it informs the coach as to what kind of kid you are. Are you going to be kind of goofing off in college or can they trust that you're going to take care of business and handle what you're supposed to handle? So I know it's that's not what a lot of kids are motivated by in high school, but it is a very, very important element. And I, I honestly, like that opened a lot of doors for me from a recruitment standpoint you know we're not even talking about college yet but like from getting recruited like my gpa i think was like a three seven or something and every school in the country that i talked to or every every school that i talked to which was about 20 schools was able to offer me in good conscience because they there's a tier system with the scholarships right if you have like a 1.1 gpa or whatever it is they only have one scholarship spot for that for that kind of guy for me three seven like i'm i don't count against that that um that requirement right so i think that's just important for kids and uh you know recruits to understand is that that's a very very important element of of the process and then um you know at school like you know i i kind of looked at it like i'm getting the school's paying me or the school's paying me um you know what is it like two hundred fifty thousand dollars for my time here and i get to go to school for free um, and if I was paying for school, how pissed would I be if I wasn't going to every class and taking advantage of these opportunities? So it just seemed like a good opportunity for me. You know, I think when I was at UCLA, I was there for five, uh, four years and a quarter. You know, I missed one class the whole time I was there. You know what I mean? And it just like it was important to me to prioritize that and do well in school. And I'm really grateful because I learned a lot. I met a lot of interesting people outside of the football department. And like when you're in the football community, like that's kind of the focus of of who the people you hang out with and that's fine but it was good for me to kind of diversify my friend group and also push myself uh, intellectually as well as physically with the football stuff yeah that's that's awesome one class in four and a half years can't say yeah. the same for my no, high school that's... career <laughs> that's wild that's wild so what are some of your favorite moments from ucla on the field 
I mean, obviously, the one that really sticks out to me, I thought, oh, gosh, I can't remember, 2007, is that right? Yeah, 2007, we beat the number one rated USC, who was our rival at the time. I think it was uh, 12 to 9 or some something like that. And that was one of the most epic football games I've been a part of. I didn't play, you know, I played fine in that game. It wasn't like I did anything spectacular. Uh, but to beat a hometown rival that was ranked nationally, they were going to the national championship game if they won. Um, like that was the biggest game I think I won in my whole career uh, in college. And, you know, went back to Westwood and there was like a riot in the street because everyone was partying, partying so hard. Like it was it was a crazy kind of like that classical, you know, like, you know, stereotypical college experience, you know, and it was it was pretty wild and really cool and really cool to kind of share that experience with my teammates who were awesome dudes at the time. And they're still awesome dudes. But yeah, that, I'd say that was probably the biggest, biggest kind of, you know, football moment of my college career. Yeah. So after college, you ended up declaring for the 2010 NFL draft. Um, what was your draft process like? And did you have any early indications to where you could have been going? Oh, yeah. So that was kind of an interesting experience. So my true senior year, so I didn't redshirt, played four years. And my fourth year, I broke my foot in like the first game of the year. So I didn't play the rest of that year. And there was some kind of, um, you know, like NFL hype around my career at that point. And then after I did that, it kind of all went away. So when I um, came back from my a medical redshirt, came back from my fifth year, um, I was an undrafted free agent. I didn't get invited to the senior bowl, didn't get invited to the combine. And, um, you know, I did the training, did my pro day, and my physical numbers were very, very unimpressive. I was very average, below average in a lot of things. But I did have an advocate uh, for me in, um, in Washington at the time. Uh, John Embry, who's the tight end coach there, he was the tight end coach my freshman year at UCLA, and he had come back and helped out a little bit during his time away. And, um, and he basically stood on the table for me here in Washington and said, there's an opportunity for you. Now, I'm not saying you're going to make the team or anything like that. Like, you got to come earn it. But having a guy like that was pretty fantastic. There were other teams that were interested, Dallas, uh, San Diego, um, Minnesota, I think. You know, a couple teams like that. But um, Washington just felt like the right fit for me um, because of the coach connection I had there with John Embry. And then also, at the time, they didn't have a lot of depth at the tight end position. There were two – uh, established veterans and Chris Cooley and Fred Davis. And, um, and then there were two kind of um, journeyman style guys. I say that with all due respect because they played a long time in the NFL, Lee Vickers and Sean Ryan. And I felt like I was competing with those guys and they didn't have any practice squad eligibility. So my agent and I kind of decided like this was the right fit. And that was really tough to do because, you know, San Diego's like right down the street from where I live. So it would have been really easy to do that. But I'm really glad I made that decision because I don't I'm not sure I would have been in the NFL having been in the NFL for 10 years and then seen um, kind of how flippant it is, you know, how moment to moment it is like having that advocate for me was what I think was the right decision in, in retrospect. Yeah, most definitely. Like you said, you know, you get undrafted and then Washington picks you up. Um, how does going undrafted kind of add fuel to the fire? And what did you do to, to stand out to the coaching staff and 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 make the 53-man roster ultimately. Yeah, I mean, I kind of knew I wasn't going to get drafted. Uh, I had no illusions about it. So for me, when I came in, I was like, you know, this is a really – this is just a cool experience. It's a cool opportunity. And, you know, my mindset at the time was what am I going to do? Like, I don't want to look back at this opportunity and regret it. And so before I left, my dad was like – my dad and my mom both were like, treat this like a job. And so my mom and my dad both have had – they've been very successful in their careers for a long time. And what I took that to mean was like, get there early, stay late, do the extra stuff, perfect your craft. And I did that. I got to the facility really early. Um, got to, I left late, did all my workouts, wasn't late to any meetings, took fastidious notes, studied when I got back to the hotel room. And I think that was probably the biggest thing is I didn't make a lot of mental mistakes. Physically, I was pushing myself every day after practice to improve my craft. Coaches saw that. And then in practice, I was an absolute lunatic. Like I basically treated every practice like it was a game. And I did that my whole career. And I know that sounds like really hard -o and like, you know, like maybe I'm exaggerating. Like many a fight was started because Logan Paulson was practicing too hard. And that's just how I did it. And like, I didn't want to look back on that moment and be like, man, I really wish I would have practiced harder. I really wish I, you know, I would have done whatever. 
And so that's just kind of the, the, the mindset I took. And I actually got cut um, my rookie year. They were going to put me on practice squad. And then um, later that day, they said, no, actually, we're going to put you on the 53. So they re-signed me to the 53-man roster, which was pretty cool. And then I was on the 53 kind of for the rest of my career, which was very, very special. And I just every day treated it like it was the most important thing in my life. And that sounds crazy, but it was for a long time. Yeah, because I mean, once you get to that point, like you're already in the top 1%. So like you've already done, you know, everything that you're always told in school that you can't do, you know, which is the crazy yeah. part. And then, you know, you get there, might as well, you might as well make the most of it, man. You got to, <laughs> you got to, you got the food on the table, you know, like right. that's the crazy part, man. It's a physical sport. You just brought it every day. A lot of dudes don't like that, but it's cool. Yeah. It's cool. So you got to come into a situation like you kind of mentioned a little bit already um, where you got to learn from two very good tight ends mm. and Chris Cooley and Fred Davis right out of the gate. Like, yeah, I don't know too many tight ends who get to go into a situation where they get to learn from two very talented guys like that. Um, how did playing with those guys kind of aid your transition to the NFL? I mean, Cooley is uh, probably one of the smartest people that you're ever going to meet. I mean, he's a very uh, bright dude. I mean, he did, he did analyst work when he retired, but he was a guy that was just incredible. And he saw the game in a very unique way. And um, he challenged me and he pushed me. And um, he also kind of gave me some insight and some tips, which were very helpful. And then obviously Fred Davis is a different type of player. But seeing what he could do physically – every day just motivated me because he was a freak athlete, freakly, freaky, strong, freaky, fast, freaky, physical. And I was like, you know, I'm going to need to put a lot of work in if I'm going to make this team. And so having both of those guys in the room at the same time, you know, even a guy like Mike Sellers, who'd been in the league for 13 years at the time, played tight end and also played a little bit of fullback, you know, just having those pros, those guys who'd been around for a long time in the room with you, as examples. And, you know, you mentioned Cooley, you mentioned Fred, but also like London Fletcher, Fletcher's on that team. Um, yeah. Philip Daniels is on that team. Guys who had been in the league for forever. London Fletcher might be a Hall of Famer, you know, like probably will be. So having those guys on the roster was instrumental to my growth because you got to see what the highest level of production and play in the NFL looked like at a very early point in my career. And I'm extremely grateful to those guys. And, you know, I mentioned Fletch, but like, Lorenzo Alexander is like was a special teams guy at the time. He ended up playing 13 years in the league. Just the professionalism he brought. Kedrick Dolston, again, another guy with great professionalism. So those guys were fantastic. And they probably don't even know it. You know, guys like Reed Dowdy, guys just grinding it out every single day. Like they showed me what it was going to take for me to make this team. And uh, very, very grateful, not only to Chris and Fred who were in my room, but those other guys who, you know, led by example and, and were mentors you know, maybe not directly, but from afar. Yeah, most definitely, man. And that's, I think that's one thing a lot of people sleep on is just like how, how strong of an impact, like the, the first, the first impression of, of, you know, coming into an NFL locker room is, is bigger than a lot of people think it is, I would imagine. Yeah. Um, and so whenever you're going and you're seeing this the, the full-time professionalism from a lot of very important people, you know, it's going to, kind of just resonate with you right away. Um, whereas a different organization may not do that, um, which takes me to my next question. You know, you spent time with three other teams, Chicago, San Francisco, and Atlanta. Also, I think Houston. Houston, well. yeah. Mm. So four other teams. Um, after spending five years in Washington, what's it like switching NFL locker rooms and how does each team kind of vary? Um, like in terms of like maybe it's you know, practice day, the culture, the food, is there, is there as big of a difference as people just naturally assume there is or kind of how is it? I mean, there, there's, there's some differences for sure. You know, there's differences in offensive philosophy, the play caller, kind of the emphasis of practice, perhaps the way they teach stuff. There's always something different there. Um, they, but I'd say on the whole, they're probably more similar than they are different. Uh, just, I think the hardest thing is just getting used to kind of the little subtle nuances that differentiate Chicago from San Francisco or San Francisco from Washington. And um, and that that was always challenging. And the other thing that was challenging about those moves is they always happen very late in the process. So I'm, you know, I'm living by myself in a hotel with my wife and my kids at home. And, you know, I'm kind of just you're, you're kind of you're not really settled. And all you have is football, which is good. You know, it's a good thing to do. But um, I, I think that 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 was the hard stuff. It wasn't necessarily learning um you know obviously learning an offense is very challenging but i got good at it over the course of my career you know like in college i had, th I had 
two offensive coordinators and then at Washington we had a couple. So I got good at kind of picking up offenses. And so that wasn't, that was hard, but not the hardest thing for me. It was more just like, what are the subtle differences and operation time, start times, all those different things. But, you know, you figure it out because you got to, and you get paid to do that. So figure it out. Yeah. Who is the best player you've ever played with and against? <laughs> um, I played, I've been very fortunate to play with some very, very good players. I mean, um, Trent Williams is probably going to be a Hall of Famer. I mentioned London Fletcher already. Played with Julio Jones when I was in Atlanta. Matt Ryan, guys who were really at the like not quite at the peak of their powers at the time, but golly, they were good. Played with New Hopkins in Houston. Uh, he was spectacular. Um, you know, say what you want about Deshaun Watson, but I got to see him when he was playing very, very good football. Uh, let me think. Jay Cutler was another guy that kind of stuck out to me. Alshon Jeffries, Eddie Royal, those guys were pretty fantastic. Jordan Reed, maybe the best uh, receiving tight end for his era. Uh, Vernon Davis I got to play with. George Kittle got to be there at the start of his career. There were some really, really talented dudes. Um, Navarro Bowman, kind of near the end of his career, uh, but still like some very, very talented people and just see how people of that kind of next tier of athleticism get it done. So, so some very, very fortunate to, to play with those guys. You mentioned a lot of names I haven't heard in quite a while, my man. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's it's been crazy. a while. It's been yeah. a while, yeah. 49ers team. I remember Navarro Bowman very well because I'm a New Orleans Saints fan. And uh, Oh, are you? Broke my heart. It's okay, though. <laughs> it's okay, though. So, what do you do or what did you do to ensure that your your body was always ready to go for game day? What were some, like – of your routines? What were some things you did to try to stay fresh the best you could? I know it's impossible during the season. But. Yeah, I was an absolute lunatic when it came to like training. So I would, um, so I would do the two, two like mandatory lifts uh, with the team every week, but then I would also lift on my own. Um, and I pretty much lifted every single day, did like a maintenance lift is what I called it. So like kind of all the little stuff and I, in retrospect, probably a little bit too much, um, but I come in after practice and do kind of a reset. I do something in the morning. Um, I'd get in the cold tubs, hot tubs, depending on what stage of my career I was at. Um, I would try to take a lot of naps. That was something that I did a lot of. And I just was really dialed in on my nutrition. You know, I was eating five, six meals a day of like really lean foods and trying to take care of myself as best I could. So did a lot. I was pretty, I was very, very invested in that. Um, you know, I, I'm now a strength coach part-time. And so looking back on some of the stuff I did, it was probably not the right thing to do, but at the time I thought it was. And, um, and yeah, so, you know, hindsight's 2020, but yeah, I did, I did a lot of stuff, tried a lot of different things. And, um, at the time I thought they were the right thing to do anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're right now, you're a post-game analyst for the Washington commanders for one Oh six, seven, the fan. So we're going to talk about the commanders a little bit. Um, so what is your current opinion on the state of the Washington Commanders? Uh, where do they need help and how do you think they fix it? Yeah, so I do I do pregame for 1067 The Fan and I do um, I'm a commentator for their command center show, which is on YouTube. So check that out. And then I do some other stuff associated with the team from like podcasts and stuff. I have my own podcast called the Take Command Podcast. So check that out if you guys are interested for more insight on the commanders. But uh, the state of the team right now, it's kind of a weird spot. I think um, obviously the ownership situation is something that is kind of looming over this offseason. Um, I think it's one of the reasons Ron is still here, uh, given that his record has kind of stayed approximately the same the whole time he's been here. I like Ron a lot. I get to see him. I think he's a fantastic coach, excellent guy. But, you know, this is a world of what have you done for me, me lately? And I know people get impatient with stuff like that. I'm not of that mindset, but that's part of it. Uh, they got to hire a new offensive coordinator. Again, that'll probably be informed in some capacity by the ownership situation. For those people who don't know, obviously, Dan appears, Dan Snyder, the owner, the current owner, seems like he's going to sell the team this offseason. That will probably won't happen until March. So it affects, you know, what you can do in free agency. It affects what you can do um, from a hiring standpoint for the coordinator position. So that'll be really kind of uh, something to keep an eye on if you're a Washington Commanders fan. And then obviously they have some big things to do, like every team does in free agency and in the draft, specifically addressing the offensive line and probably the secondary in some capacity. So um, lots of things this offseason. And, uh, you know, we haven't even talked about the quarterback, which is probably the most position, important position in sports. Sam Howell seems like they're going to is going to be the guy for next year. 
But again, you know, he's a second year player who hasn't played a ton, fifth round pick. So we'll see what happens. A lot of interesting, compelling storylines for this team. Um, and, uh, you know, never a boring day with the Washington Commanders, I'll tell you. Yeah, it was crazy, too, because I feel like everyone just like counted out the Commanders from the jump this year. And then they almost made the playoffs. Yeah. <laughs> it was, yeah. It was a crazy season. There's a lot to look forward to, though. You know, John is so. a very good, very good young receiver out there. There's just a lot of a lot of good talent in general and out in Washington that I like. Chase Young. Yeah, 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 a lot of I mean I think that's the thing that's exciting if if you're looking for things to be optimistic about is they've got a very solid core of young players. Benjamin St. Juiced looked excellent this year playing corner. Jamin Davis, the former first round pick, started playing like a first round pick. Chase Young coming back from injury. Deron Payne played like an absolute maniac this year. John Allen does what John Allen does, made the Pro Bowl. Montez Sweat almost led the team in sacks. Like there is a lot of really exciting things defensively to be excited about. Then you mentioned Jahan, Brian Robinson, the running back is outstanding. So lots of young pieces. DeForest, uh, not DeForest, uh, Derek, Derek Forrest, the safety who kind of emerged this year. Cam Curl. There's a ton of things to be excited about. Um, it's just about can they get it all to click and all that talent to come together. And can they go on a run to make the playoffs this next season in 2023? So, yeah, um, yeah, lots of things to be excited about, just about whether it falls the way you think it should fall, you know? Yeah. I actually have Benjamin St. Juice college gloves right here next to me. Do you really? Yeah, sir. Why, why do you have those? Well, we had, we made a little connection uh, back whenever he was coming out of the draft. I tried to get him on the podcast. He was a little bit too busy with the pre-draft process mm -hmm. and all that. But you should ask him again now. It's offseason. Yeah. Maybe he'd be into yeah. it. I know. I got to. I got to. We're friends on Facebook and all that good stuff. So I'll have to hit him up again. But yeah, his gloves are right here. I, and I just talked with uh, I talked with a few Commanders players a few weeks ago. So yeah, I, I talked to Jonathan Williams uh, a couple oh, weeks nice. ago. So that was good. So he gave me some good insight too. So cool. it was a good time. I, I I like I literally I like low key love the Commanders a little bit, man. <laughs> so we're we're pulling for him. We're pulling for him. Appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> so I, you just kind of talked about it a little bit, but I saw a report recently talking about how Sam Howell was going to be the starting quarterback moving oh, forward yeah. in Washington potentially. Um, tell us about Sam, what you like, dislike, and if you think this is the right move for Washington moving forward. Yeah, so I think Sam, obviously, like he's a fifth round pick, and that's a designation that I don't necessarily disagree with. I thought coming out of UNC, he was insulated or propped up a little bit by the offense. Obviously, he's got some tremendous physical tools. He's got a quick release, good arm. He's got kind of a sneaky runner, which I think is interesting because, you know, when you look at him, he doesn't look like he'd be built that way. Uh, came in the preseason and some of the, you know, things you see with young quarterbacks, just not fully – uh, embracing the timing elements of the offense. His footwork is off. His accuracy is a little bit off. He holds the ball a long time. Uh, but the talent is is there for him. You know, it's there. And then he started the last game of the season against Dallas and looked very good. Didn't look like the moment was too big for him in a, in a pretty big game. You know, it, it didn't mean anything for Washington, but it did mean something for Dallas. So he's playing against the first defense. And obviously the game flow is a little bit unique. Um, Dallas drops the punt early in the game. Uh, the punter muffs the punt, muffs the catch of the long snap. They, the first drive starts at the 20, the first throw of Sam Howell's career is for a touchdown or the second throw. And then the next play, they muff a punt. So they're up 14 to zero without even, or 10 to zero without even batting an eye and having to do nothing on offense, which again, affects how the game flows. But Sam did some really nice stuff, had an excellent deep ball to Terry, you know, nice throws to Jahan Dotson. You mentioned him already. And just generally the moment did not look too big for him. Uh, obviously like, Scott Turner, the former offensive coordinator, I think did a good job of kind of putting Sam in a position to be successful. And the game flow also supported Sam being successful. So did he show a lot of potential? Yes. Was this a very unique game situation? Yes. Is it enough to kind of say he should be our starter for next year? I'm of the mindset that says, no, I think you need to make sure you have some type of veteran presence in here. Like, you know, Jacoby Brissett, a guy that can mentor win you a couple games until Sam is is definitively ready to start. But I, I think there is a lot of potential in him. And I think if you can get a, a rookie quarterback contract kind of as your starter for the next couple of years, that just bodes well for you making a very strong roster and, and winning a bunch of games. So hopefully that works out. But obviously it's still early in the offseason. Lots of things still need to happen for that. So Yeah, most definitely. Let's talk about the NFL playoffs this weekend. Who, who oh, do you God. got? Yeah, who do you got so, moving on? 
Man, I am so excited for that 49ers game. So excited for that 49ers game. Like it's it just seems like, you know, that old adage like styles make fights. I totally agree. You get the number one defense against arguably what I think is one of the most dynamic offenses in the NFL in Philly. And what I mean by dynamic is they can beat you in multiple ways. They have AJ Brown, they've got uh Smith, they've got all these, they've got Goddard. And then you've got the running element of the quarterback. You've got the best offensive line in football. So what is the plan to kind of neuter this really strong, dynamic 49ers defense? And then offensively, you've got one of the most curious offenses in the NFL with all these kind of hybrid players. Debo Samuel could play running back. Christian McCaffrey could play wide receiver. George Kittle is one of the most dynamic tight ends in football. Again, a great offensive line. How do you match up from an X's and O's standpoint with that? Obviously, Philadelphia is talented enough to do that. You know, they've got two of the best corners, maybe the best cornerback tandem in football, two outstanding safeties, big physical defensive line. Can they slow Brock Purdy down? You saw what that looked like last week against Dallas. So I think it's going to be an excellent football game, and I can't wait to watch it. But I'd have to probably lean San Francisco, I think, just because Kyle Shannon, I think, is a very bright dude and is going to put those guys in a good position to be successful. But I, I can't wait to watch it. it. You know, right now it's a coin fit for me. I'm just slightly leaning San Fran, probably because I know Kyle. So I'm going to lean that way a little bit. But I think that's going to be an excellent football game. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I mean, former 49ers tied in. I mean, you yeah. have to see the start of Kittle's career. Like, mm. you know, you got to pull for him a little bit. Yeah, right. I'd love, I'd love to see that that 49ers squad in the Super Bowl. That would just be very exciting. Who do you have from the AFC? Yeah, so, I mean, it's going to sound crazy, but I, I think, Cincinnati like should be favored. I mean, obviously Mahomes is hurt and I feel weird kind of betting against Mahomes because I think he's, he's one of the, he's the best quarterback in football, maybe second. Yeah. He's the best quarterback in football right now. So, um, you know, like they have, again, a great offensive line, excellent stable of playmakers. The defense is playing better for him, but Kansas city just seems to have Mahomes number. You know, they beat him in the regular season. They beat him in the playoffs last year. Like, I don't know. It just seems like, that's the way it's going to go. And I think when you look at how dominant they, uh, Kansas City, or not Kansas City, Cincinnati was against the Bills, I mean, you got to kind of ride the hot hand a little bit. And I hate predicting games based off of that, but it just feels like they're in the right state of mind right now to win some football games. So I'm going to say Cincinnati, but again, like, I feel weird picking against Patrick Mahomes. Let me just say that. Yeah. I, I think the whole the whole nation, besides you know Kansas City, Missouri, wants <laughs> wants Cincinnati to win. I feel like um, people just like to hate against great, you know. But yeah. Eli Apple's making that a little bit more difficult this past week. So we'll move on, though. We'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move on. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know what his deal is, but it's making it tough to cheer for the Bengals, man. It's making it tough. <laughs> so. Um, tell us about, we're going to go back. We're going to go back to Logan Paulson's life. Tell us about a time it could be on the field or off the field that you've had to battle adversity. How'd you overcome it? Um, tell us about the adversity and how you overcame it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, everything, there's a little bit of adversity, you know, throughout your life. I, I know I've been very fortunate never have to face anything too dramatic. Obviously I've had injuries that I've had to overcome, which were, which were pretty significant. Um, you know, I think one of the kind of most formative things, formative types of adversities in my life was when I was playing soccer and I got cut from that team. And everyone says, oh, well, you got cut from your team. Like I told you at the beginning of the podcast that soccer was very, very important to me. Mm -hmm. And what that did for me is it showed me that getting cut wasn't necessarily the end of the world. Right. It showed me that I could I could work through stuff and it, and it kind of seeded that thing in you, you know what I mean? That, that drive, that hunger that says I need to be better. I need to be constantly improving. I, I can't ever be satisfied because if you are satisfied, they're going to make a different decision. So that was, that was something that I think was, was very, uh, very kind of shaped me in a very dramatic way at a young age. And then one of the hardest things in my professional career, besides the injuries was when I got cut in Atlanta. That was devastating to me because I really enjoyed the culture and the camaraderie and the teamwork there. And it was something that affected me negatively for a long time because I, I felt like I deserved to make the team and I felt like I I worked hard enough to make the team and I was a little bit bitter about it. And so that was a really important growing experience for me. You know, I'd been cut before multiple times, but I kind of understood where I fit in the hierarchy, you know, and I understood that that was a possibility. Here, I just felt like um, it just felt different. And I really wanted to be in Atlanta. And so that was a very, very challenging time, you know, for for my life. And 
and I, again, I think while that hurt really bad and that stung, it teaches you a lot about yourself and it teaches you a lot about how to cope with those moments. And, um, and despite the kind of the, the sting and the pain that it caused me at the time, I'm really grateful because it, it helps you grow and, um, you know, any type of adversity, I know it feels negative, but it always, if you can kind of spin it and say, I'm going to learn from this and I'm not going to dwell in it. Um, it, it helps you, it helps you grow. So, um, I don't know that, that those are kind of some things that I think informed my, some adversity that I experienced when I was playing and that it, you know, I think it made me a better person as a result. Most definitely. Logan, I have one more question for you. And it's a question I ask every single person on this podcast. What is a piece of advice that maybe you've stumbled across in your life, or maybe it's just straight from your heart, but what's a piece of advice that you'd like to give to the listeners today? I mean, there's so much, so much advice I've gotten from really smart people that I'm, I'll be eternally grateful for. But I think the one thing that I've, I've kept with me since I was very young was something my dad used to say, which is like, uh, hard work beats talent when talent fails to work hard. And I know that it's like the most cliche thing of all time, but it is something that has just been so true for me in my life. I told you at the time, like my agent will call me up and he just, he, you know, gets these young guys and this guy's going to run a four, four, this guy's going to run a four, five. And we were joking the other day that like, like Logan, like you literally had, you were red. Like, so what they do, if you have a, a, a physical characteristic that is not kind of draftable, they give you a red dash and he's like, Logan, your entire athletic profile was a bunch of red dashes. Like I was not fast. I was not explosive. I was decently strong, but like nobody cares about that. And so I look at that and I say like every single person that I played against or that I played behind in my career was physically more gifted than me. So then why was I playing in the NFL? And it's simply because I worked harder than them at the thing. Right. And so that's, that's one thing. And the other thing is like prioritizing what's important to you. And this is something like I used to do like these um, rookie mentorship meetings when I was in Atlanta and all these kids would, you know, be like, I say, Hey guys, like, you know, how important is football to you? Like, would you, you, how many times have you said I die for football or like whatever. And they all put their hands up. Like, this is the most important thing in my life. And I was like, if it is the most important thing in your life, treat it as such prioritize this and direct your work, direct that, that work we were just talking about towards this task and don't let anything else cloud you from your goal. And I think th those, those kind of two bits of advice together are probably the thing that I think are, are most important is if don't let anybody outwork you, cause that's the thing you can control and make sure that you're focused on your task. And I think, um, that those things are, if I look back at my career, are the things that have shaped me most dramatically. Most definitely. Ladies and gentlemen, Logan Paulson, 10-year NFL veteran tight end. Thank you so much for hopping on the show today. I appreciated your insight, and I got to pick your brain a little bit and learn a lot about the Washington Commanders today, which is great. <laughs> so that was awesome. Um, thank you once again for hopping on the show. Uh, where can we find you at on social media? Yeah, I'm on I'm on Instagram. I haven't done the Twitter thing yet. Everyone keeps telling me I should, but uh, Logan underscore Paulson82 is uh, my Instagram. And I do like film breakdowns and stuff on there that I do with the show uh, for the, for uh, for Command Center, excuse me. So check that out if you want to get smarter doing some football stuff. Yeah, I love it. I, I genuinely love watching it because it's oh, great. Good. It's good. just good. Good football knowledge is very appreciated from this avenue, at least. So. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Once again, Logan, thank you so much for hopping on the show. I'm super excited to stay tuned with all the great things you're working on, man. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for having me on, man. Really appreciate it. I had a great time. Yes, sir.